everybody to rock and roll a little bit? Ready to raise the roof? Woo. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that in just a moment, I promise. But first, let's go back to 1956, when Nat King Cole and his wife wake up in a bedroom that is not theirs. In fact, the house is just eight blocks to the east. And the owner of that house is sitting up in the living room, doing what he promised Nat King Cole he'd do, which is keep him safe from white supremacists. Earlier, Nat King Cole had been attacked on stage, on stage in Birmingham, Alabama, by white supremacists. And after that, his management canceled his southern tour. Because, wouldn't you? But there was a concert promoter in Raleigh named Joe Winters, a black concert promoter. And he called New York and he said, Nat has got to continue that tour. I've got him booked soon for two sold out shows at Memorial Auditorium, the prime place for concerts in North Carolina. And I imagine Nat King Cole's management said, well, look, you might lose your shirt, but Nat's not gonna lose his life. I'm sorry. And I imagine that Joe Winter said, but look, if Nat King Cole doesn't come back to the South, then will any other black acts come through the South anymore? I imagine the management company said, we don't manage those acts. We manage Nat King Cole, who we're gonna keep safe. And I imagine that Joe Winter said, I am gonna keep him safe because not only am I a concert promoter, the concert promoter for black acts in North Carolina, I am a city of Raleigh policeman. Well, that got somebody's notice because Nat King Cole did decide to come to Raleigh. And Joe Winters went and picked him up at the airport among much media fanfare. Nat King Cole was back in the South. And Joe Winters took Nat King Cole in his Cadillac to his house in Southeast Raleigh where the neighbors came from all over and they listened to Nat plunk out tunes on an out-of-tune piano in the family living room. And then Joe whisked Nat over to Memorial Auditorium for two sold-out shows. And then back home and back to bed. And you know, I imagine that every neighbor that came to see Nat King Cole at Joe Winter's house that day, sure, they were excited because they were meeting a pop star. But they also knew they were celebrating a victory because this particular pop star would shine again in the South. But the remarkable double life of Joe Winters was just getting started and about to kick into even higher gear. Now before we keep walking the beat with Joe Winters, I wanna pause and tell you how excited I was when I first heard that story, I was bowled over because I love pop music and I'm a history buff. And boy, that was just singing my song right there. I was so, I felt so lucky to be hearing that story about Joe Winters, who from the 1930s to the 1970s, from Jim Crow to black power, was a police officer and a concert impresario who bridged the color line one superstar at a time. Now, I would not have heard that story were it not for a friend of mine who's a contractor named Greg Paul. He told me about a house he was renovating in Southeast Raleigh where he had found a treasure, a treasure trove of concert posters and contracts. Contracts aren't all that exciting, but when they had the name of Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles on them, those contracts get awful exciting. And I rushed down to that house and I met Joe Winters surviving children, Shekana and Joe Winters Jr., who shared with me the story of their father. And that story took shape in my mind as a song, as Joe Winters' song. He gave the community a chance to sing songs it hadn't been able to, as we'll see. And he gave the community a stage to be its best self. I feel honored to share that song with you now. 
Joe Winters, born in 1912, the middle of 12 children. That's a lot of miles to feed, and his parents had to be serious people. When Joe's mother died young, Joe's father sent him to New York City with the younger siblings to leave them there with family members to take care of. Now imagine that young man, Joe Winters, up in New York City seeing all those lights and leaving his brothers and sisters to adventures there while he had to return to Raleigh. But he did because the song of Joe Winters' life is about purpose and service and uplift. So Joe came back to Raleigh and he married his sweetheart and went to St. Augs and studied math. And while he was there, he met a man named Dave Weaver who was bringing black acts to play in Raleigh, segregated Raleigh. The black acts played various clubs designated for black people. The Masonic Lodge, which still stands three blocks that away. Joe Winters liked that. He liked the music. He liked the glamour of it. He wanted to do that with the rest of his life. Be a concert promoter. A big dream took root in his mind. Black people already came to Raleigh from all over eastern North Carolina. They called a culture town for parks and for the shops. And Joe had this vision of providing nighttime entertainments for those trips. Not at the Masonic Lodge, but on a grand scale. Oh man, he had a vision and he was on his way. But life was cooking up something a little different for Joe. And he got called into a meeting of the Southeast Raleigh elders. You see, back then, 1930s, black police departments around the South had decided they needed to hire some black police officers. Now, this wasn't because the police departments around the South had some great vision of equality. No, they just figured, according to my research, that black officers would deal with the black populations and take that job off the hands of white officers. So Raleigh had hired its first black police officer, John Baker. Now they thought John Baker needs a partner. They went to the community elders and said, who you got? Who's right for this job? Well, the community elders needed somebody confident, calm, but always in control. They called Joe Winters in and they said, Joe, what are your plans for the rest of your life? Well, you know, I was thinking I love the concert business. Joe, you're joining the Raleigh PD. No matter how conflicted he felt about that, Joe Winters accepted that challenge because those folks told him that's what the community needed. He accepted it, but he did not surrender. He joined the system, but he did not surrender, as we'll see. Because Joe Winters' song, Uplift and Service and Purpose, he was still singing that song. He just added a new verse. Now, life in the police department for those first black officers back in the 30s, it wasn't easy. Some of them were made to wear used uniforms. And in some places around the South, they could not use the restrooms at police headquarters. They were not treated as equals. But Joe persevered. The job could be boring, police work can be mundane, and it had its share of perils, as we'll find out more about. There's domestic disturbances and brawls. There was a prison riot, and Joe was right there. He was right there on the day job, and he was on the night job. Down in a little office in the basement, he was still working out that dream to become a concert promoter. And as a police officer, he had some standing. He was able to start to book acts in the Memorial Auditorium, the prime place for concerts in North Carolina. And on a modest policeman's salary, he was bringing in the biggest black pop stars in America. I'm talking Nat King Cole, Ray Charles, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald. And man, Joe loved that music. 
He loved the finer things. And that music made him so, so happy. But there was an earthquake coming. Oh, yeah. First, let me tell you that those shows, they were segregated, as was the custom, the law in the South. White folks were sent to Cameron Village, which was the suburbs of Raleigh back then, to buy their tickets. The posters show that. Black folks were sent to Hamlin Drugs, downtown Raleigh, to buy their tickets. And when they came in to Memorial Auditorium, they were segregated in where they sat. It might be black people over here, it might be white people on the floor, black people in the balcony. Different arrangements, but segregated. Keep the black folks and the white folks apart. And that's just how it was. Until, as I said, here comes rock and roll. Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Fats Domino. It wasn't Joe's favorite music, but Joe was a sharp businessman. And he started booking those acts. Oh yeah, putting them in Memorial Auditorium. And that changed everything. Because who wanted to see those acts? Not the folks who were going to see Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington. Those were the grown-ups. They were set in their ways. They had their minds made up. Rock and roll appealed to their kids who still had their ears open, had their minds open to new ideas. So when Little Richard came to town and he insisted that Joe book he and his band to stay at the Sir Walter Hotel, the crown jewel of the Raleigh establishment, and Joe pulled that off, and then Little Richard and his band decided to have a parade from the Sir Walter Hotel down to Memorial Auditorium, yeah, the black kids wanted to see that, and so did the white kids. So did the white kids. And then it came time for them to flood into Memorial Auditorium and see the show. Fats Domino, Little Richard, Chuck Berry. I know you can hear that in your head. And you know that's not sit down and appreciate the artistry music. That's get up and dance music. That's not sit down music. And so the show starts, and the music's pumping, and those white kids who are up in the balcony, white kids up in the balcony for those shows, black kids on the floor, the white kids stand up. And they want to get down there. They want to get down there, get closer to the music, get closer to Chuck Berry. So they're getting up, and they're headed to the stairs. And now I want, I want us to create, recreate that sound that must have been in Joe Winter's head as he was in there as the concert impresario, the guy in charge of it already. Joe, 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 Joe. The music's pounding. The white kids are dancing. The black kids are dancing. The white kids are headed to the floor. And what does Joe Winters do? In that moment, cop, concert impresario. Joe Winters does not enforce the color line at that moment. Joe Winters lets those white kids come down the stairs and dance with the black kids. And there'd be no more color line at Joe Winters' shows. And that made a huge difference to those kids. One of those kids, Burley Mitchell, he's an older fella now, but man, does he light up when he talks about Joe Winters' shows at Memorial Auditorium. Burley was from a well-to-do family, he had a privileged upbringing in Raleigh. And when he saw black people, Burley's a white fella, they were in service roles. And he said, when I talked to him, that they never seemed too happy. And that was his idea of black people. They were in service roles, and they didn't seem happy about it, and that was about it. But when he went to those shows, to Joe's shows, and he saw black people having as much fun as he was, they just wanted to have a good time. They just wanted to look good for their dates. And they just wanted to dance. And Burley, the white kid, danced with the black kids and made some friends. He told me that changed everything for him. And he told me that set the stage for integration in Raleigh, but all over the country when the color line broke. It set the stage for integration. And it's heartening to think 
that Burley Mitchell carried that mindset into the work he did later in life as the Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. Now, Joe Winters never gave a big speech about how he felt during those heady days of breaking the color line. He wasn't a politician. He just kept on working. Soon he was bringing Motown to Raleigh. And the white kids and the dance kids and the black kids were coming together and dancing. He decided he wanted to expand his promotions business to include professional wrestling. It was a big thing. He got in his car. He drove two hours to see the wrestling kingpin of the South. He got out and went into the lobby. The receptionist said, well, I'm sorry, sir. Joe was a black man, after all. But you'll have to use the back door. Well, Joe Winters did leave the lobby, but he didn't go in the back door. He got back in his car, a Cadillac, thank you, and drove back to Raleigh and kept working. Soon he was bringing Parliament Funkadelic and a whole new breed of acts to Raleigh. And the kids kept coming. And Joe kept working, kept singing his song of purpose and service and uplift until he died at the age of 92. Before I close, I want to hit on Joe's police work because we're all talking a lot about police work these days. In 1966, Joe and his partner at that time, T.T. Street, another black man, T.T. Street now, that ought to be a character in a TV show. He and Joe were on patrol, and they got a bulletin that there had been an armed robbery in downtown Raleigh, and that the crook had escaped with a lot of money, and that the crook was armed. Keep your eye out for the car. Well, not long after that, Joe and T.T. Street saw that car, just parked. Windows down, there was the guy who had been described in the driver's seat, just sitting there. So Joe and T.T. Street, they get out of their car. And Joe, the older officer, tells T.T. Street, there's not going to be any shooting. He has T.T. approach from the passenger side, and Joe starts to slowly approach from the driver's side. There's not going to be any shooting. And Joe's talking to the guy in the car, who's just sitting there, the bank robber with the gun. Joe's just talking to him. He's got a certain rhythm going. Joe knows all about rhythm. He's got some patter going. He knows all about patter from all those decades of dealing with temperamental artists and their conniving managers. Rhythm and patter. He's talking to the guy. It's going to be okay. We're going to get this all taken care of. Just come out of the car. And as Joe gets closer to that open window, the guy finally makes a move. He's reaching for something. It could be the gun. Joe doesn't shoot. Joe runs up to that window, grabs the guy, and he and T.T. Street haul him out of the car. And they find the money in the car, and they find the gun. And the gun was a toy. Joe Winters was a cool customer. Uplift and service and purpose at all times. That's a wonderful song to sing. And I'm proud to sing it to you, and I hope you'll go out and sing it. And I hope you'll keep your ears open, like those kids who love rock and roll kept their ears open. Keep your ears open for other songs to sing. Because in our culture, more and more, it's about singing about ourselves. Which is fine. I took a selfie today, and that selfie's going to kill on social media, and that's okay. It doesn't make me a bad person. But keep your ears open for other people's songs. People who don't have a big stage to sing on. And let's sing those loud and proud. Every day, the world is a beautiful playlist of new songs waiting to be discovered. Thank you.